Scripture reading this evening is coming from the book of Psalm, Psalm 119, it'll be verses 97 through 104, Psalm 119, we're going to begin in verse 97, it is written, Oh, how I love thy law, it is my meditation all the day, thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Good evening. <clears throat> Good to see all of you this evening. Beautiful, beautiful day we're having. And great that we're able to meet together again this evening. Just appreciate the good uh, songs that we've sung. And I'll tell you that the song, Give Me the Bible, I've always loved that song. I know we sing that with a degree of regularity, but obviously it's a song that is very apropos for what we're talking about and what we're going to be dealing with in tonight's lesson. And one of the things that I wanted to do in the very beginning of this lesson is we're going to be talking about the Bible, why the Bible is important, as I've just put why the Bible, is I want to share with you some quotes, some very notable quotes that or moving to me, and these have to deal with a lot of individuals that have been significant figures in history, that the vast majority of these are names that we're familiar with. There may be a couple that might be obscure, that perhaps a few would understand who that person is, uh, just a couple of that are a little more obscure, as I should say. But it's amazing to me that the view that people have taken of the Bible and have recognized its importance and its significance in all of human history. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, for example, who lived in the 17th century, well, he was born in 1641 and died in 1727. Sir Isaac Newton said, there are more sure marks of authenticity in the Bible than any in any profane history. I account the scriptures of God the most sublime philosophy. Coming to this country in some of our early leaders, including President George Washington, President Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. <clears throat> Another president, early president, John Quincy Adams, said the first and almost the only book deserving of universal distinction is the Bible. I speak as a man of the world to men of the world and say to you, search the scriptures. Daniel Webster said, if we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering. But if we and our posterity neglect its instruction and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury us in our glory in profound obscurity. President Abraham Lincoln, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. Woodrow Wilson, President Wilson, a man has deprived himself of the best there is in the world who has deprived himself of a knowledge of the Bible. President Theodore Roosevelt, almost every man who has, ha who has his life's work added to the sum of human achievements of which the race is proud, almost every such man has based 
his life's work largely upon the teachings of the Bible. Patrick Henry. The Bible is worth more than all other books which have ever been printed. Robert E. Lee. Maybe it's not politically correct for me to quote him, but I'm going to anyway. In all my perplexities and distresses, the Bible has never failed to give me light and strength. American journalist of the 19th century, died in 1872, Horace Greeley. It is impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible reading people. The principles of the Bible are the groundwork of human freedom. W.E. Gladstone, British statesman and was prime minister in the 19th century of Great Britain. I have known 95 of the world's great men in my time, and of, those the, uh, and of these 87 were followers of the Bible. The Bible is stamped with a specialty of origin and an immeasurable distance separate from, separated from all competitors. Swiss-born and French philosopher and skeptic, skeptic, Jean Rousseau. I must confess to you that the, maj the majesty of the scriptures astonishes me. If it had been the invention of man, the inventor would have been greater than the greatest heroes. Pursue the books of philosophers with all their pomp of diction. How meager, how contemptible are they when compared with the scriptures. The majesty of the scriptures strikes me with admiration. English biologist, Sir Thomas Huxley. I've always been strongly in favor of secular education without theology, but I must confess that I've been less seriously perplexed to know by what practical measures the religious feeling, which is the essential basis of moral conduct, is to be kept on the present utterly chaotic state of opinion on these matters without the use of the Bible. The Bible has been the Magna Carta of the poor and oppressed. And finally, Sir William Herschel, English astronomer and philosopher, said all human discoveries seem to be made only for the purpose of confirming more and more strongly the truths contained in sacred scriptures. There are so many others, and I, when I was doing some research and trying to get various views of what famous individuals thought about the Bible, it just astonishes me that how many, the, the great amount of people that understand that the Bible as God's word has been the greatest influence on history of, of men, of any other book of antiquity, and not only of books of antiquity, even modern books today, the Bible continues to outsell every other book. The Bible is the only book that really has been translated into basically every language that is spoken upon the planet today. So as the psalmist David has testified concerning the efficacy of God's inspired word, in the reading that we just had that Brother Ross did for us just a couple of moments ago, we're going to be looking at verses 97 through 104 again as we'll pick out a few points that I want to use as major points. But what is the verse that immediately follows that? Because I had him read that section that would take us through 104, but we are all familiar with verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to to my path, is what David says. Your word. David acknowledges that without the Bible, without God's word, that we would be all lost in darkness. That the only illumination that will provide the light that we need in a very dark, sinful, at times ugly world, is the influence of God's word. And so this brief analysis of these passages are certainly worthy of our consideration and not only that we understand that really the bulk of the 119th psalm this very lengthy psalm of 176 verses is dealing with the power and the efficacy of God's word but there were some things that really struck me that as I look at this why the bible and I thought of these five points 
as I was looking at this, five points that just stood out to me in these few verses that we have before us. Why the Bible? Why the significance? Why the Bible is important? And when you look at verse 97, if you just have your Bible still open, to that 119th Psalm in verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. I say to you, why the Bible? The Bible, because the Bible in daily meditation is what's going to get us through. It's what's going to help us. The Bible in daily meditation is going to be upon the hearts of people. The people who take time to look at God's word and by doing that we would become a blessed people. The Bible in daily meditation can only bless us. Refusing it, ignoring it, or just having it in our possession, which we all do, but not doing anything with it. There is no blessedness at all. But I want to look at this from the very positive standpoint because this is what David is saying. That when we take the time to study the Bible, to read the Bible, and to meditate upon it, it's not a matter of just reading it and allowing it to come into our minds and then go immediately outside of our minds. But when we really take the time to meditate upon these points, let me tell you, we're going to be a blessed people. I had referred to, and I said I would do it again this evening, but there's a couple of passages that I dealt with in this morning's lesson that are repeats that I want to deal with in tonight's lesson as well. And that takes us to the first psalm. And again, as I brought out this morning, so I want to say again this evening, that in the Davidic psalm, the first psalm of Psalm 1 and verse 1, there he speaks about, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. The very first thing, and it's interesting to me, that these are the first words that we read from this glorious book of Psalms, but it speaks about a man's position. It speaks about his walk, of his stand, his, his seating, where he sits, his position. And the blessed man is one that is not going to find himself being involved in fellowship with that which is of the world of sinful and evil and darkness. But rather, his delight, verse 2, is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. I cannot emphasize it enough because this is the emphasis of the first psalm. The Bible in daily meditation. Of what it means to us. What kind of daily doses do we get? We allow ourselves to receive doses of a lot of things that are intellectually influential. Mentally, emotionally, and intellectually influential. That how many doses do we get every day from the internet? Or from television? Or from books? or from periodicals, from social media? How many daily doses do we get of these kinds of things? And especially now when we contrast that with the daily meditation of the Word of God, of the Bible. We need this. Why the Bible? Because it's God's Word speaking to us. It is instructive. Again, it is illuminating. It can only lead us to truth if we will, with good conscience, with great fervor and diligence, with open hearts and honesty, when we will open it up and we will read it as we should and think about it, and as I said this morning, and pray about it. This is going to lead us to a meditation. The Bible in daily meditation. In Philippians 4.8 when the Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Philippi, he says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. We've preached about that. We've talked about that. You've studied that. We even, the very first lectureship that we had with our returning preachers, we tore that passage apart. Do you remember that, Mario? We tore that passage apart. But here's what I want you to think about. 
When the Apostle Paul speaks about things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, do we not understand that those are principles that emanate from God's word? They come from the very personality of God. They come from his word. That's why they're worth meditating upon. David understood that. As he looked at the law of the Lord, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And he could speak by experience. Because when David found himself in situations of his life when he was not meditating upon the will of God and the law of God, and he allowed his mind to, be, to run into interference of other things of this world, look what it got him. It's where pride and immorality and all kinds of things became a great interruption to him spiritually. We face the same issues today that David did. Is it any different today than it was in the days of David? It really is not. And the only thing that may be different is just the accessibility of certain things because of the speed of which the internet may work and, and just the way of mass media that we have in the world today that so much is printed and so much is electronically filed and there may be again that great speed of which we can access but I want to tell you that the real issues remain the same and why the Bible? Because when we meditate upon the Bible daily, daily, we read it and think about it and pray about what we have read I'm going to tell you, this becomes our salvation. Why did those great men of history say the things that they said about the Bible? Because they saw historically the influence that it has had on societies and the influence that it had upon this American society for the majority of those quotations. Understanding that it was our only salvation, our only way. And I was moved by a couple of those quotes to what become acknowledgments that when this country and when this society, when it decides to distance itself from the teachings of the Bible and from the principles of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you right now, and one does not need to be a prophet, one just needs to look at Scripture, that when we do that, we are in trouble. So what do we do? We meditate about on the Bible every day and we pray about it and we try to be the difference and we try to be the voices of reason in our society. The Bible and daily meditation. Look at verse 98 of our original text of Psalm 119. In Psalm 119 and verse 98, then David continues, you, through your commandments, Make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. David had enemies, and he says, my enemies are ever with me. There were times his enemies were chasing him. He says, they're ever with me. We don't have the same enemies of David, literally speaking. He had some enemies that came out of his own household. There were times that he had a son that pursued him and wanted to see his father to really fail. Do you remember some of the lessons about Absalom? He had enemies all around him, and it could have been the Philistines, and it could have been other heathen nations. But the thing that he was appreciating here in linking to the word of God, to the law of the Lord, and through the commandments of God, he says, through your commandments... Make me wiser than my enemies. Why the Bible? I want to tell you. Because the, the Bible makes us wiser than the world. You want to know something? The world in many respects is our enemy. I'm not talking about all of the people of the world. I'm talking about how the Bible addresses the whole subject of the world. The world that does not know God. And the world who has its own prince. Who is the prince of this world? Scripture says Satan is. Why the Bible? Why meditate upon it daily? Why know its commandments? Because through the commandments, through the commandments of God, what he teaches, it makes me wiser than my enemies. We don't have the same enemies as David, but I want to ask you, do we all have enemies? And you know why we have enemies? Because Satan does not want us to succeed. 
And the enemies can be found in a variety of ways. It could be people that are enemies of the cross of Jesus that are absolutely opposed to Christianity. But it could be a lot of different kinds of enemies when you look at the philosophies of the world or when you look at the moral standard of the world today and those that would ridicule and chide Christians for what we believe and for what we stand. You may have enemies and not even realize it, and they could be at your work, they could be in your neighborhood, they could be of your own family. But when we know Scripture and we know the commandments of God, David is saying this makes us wiser. What does the world do? The world simply chases after evil. It always has. It was so bad in Genesis chapter 6, there that it was acknowledged that man's thoughts, the intent of his heart was evil continuously. And, and God decided to destroy the world in the days of Noah with the flood. But it hasn't really changed. That even though God spared man, and we can come all the way over to the New Testament, and in 1 Peter chapter 4, listen to what Peter says to Christians. Christians, by the way, who are suffering because of the enemy. They were suffering because there were people that were standing opposed to Christianity. And Satan will use people and means, all different kinds of devices, to try to get us down emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. He wants us to get down. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3. And Peter says to these Christians, We have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust." drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, I mean, abominable idolatries. That's what the world had to offer then. It's what the world has to offer today. Verse 4, in regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Why the Bible? The Bible makes us wiser than our enemies. The Bible makes us wiser than the world. And while the world does not get why we take such a religious stand and a moral stand, this spiritual stand, the world is never going to get that. But if we will concentrate on the things of God and if we'll meditate upon the Word of God, and brethren, I'm appealing to you right now, read it every day and start committing it to Scripture, to, to memory, the Scripture to memory. Start knowing the Bible and the Scripture inside out. I, I, cannot, I, I cannot emphasize it enough. That this is our defense. In just our small little children's classroom just across the hall here, what was it that those young children after weeks and weeks working with teachers and, 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 and Betsy in particular, working on what? Ephesians 6, the what? The whole armor of God. To stand against what? The wiles of the devil. The methods and the schemes and the devices of the devil. And what are we teaching these little children? To take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. To take the shield of faith, to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. To put on the, the, this, this armor, this breastplate of righteousness, and this belt of truth. All of this panoply, this armor of God. Why? To know the Scripture because it is our only defense. We don't teach that to children simply or merely because we can make them adorable costumes which they are. But we want them to understand this is our defense. Why the Bible? Don't we want our children to be wiser than the world and to be wiser than the enemies of the cross? The world is wise in its own eyes. Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 7, it's wise in its own eyes. And the world thinks it's so smart. And, and we obviously, we don't know what we're doing, what it, how silly it is that we have faith, that we put trust in God, and that we would go around and think that we... And, and by the way, I, I want you to know this because I tell you, I was looking for a good picture of the Bible, and, and I thought, I want to find one that's been used. And what made me think about that was Justin the other day having class with Justin and Nikki just a couple of weeks ago, and I looked over the table, and there's Justin's Bible. It doesn't look quite that tattered on the outside, although it's starting to show some real wear, but I'll tell you what I was impressed with is that I looked at his, and, I, and no matter where I opened it up, and it was underlined, and it was highlighted, and there were notes written, and, his, and, his, and I want to tell you what, that's what we need to do. We need to know the Scripture because it gives us the advantage over the enemy. Do you believe that? 
The only way that Moses' instruction to the children of Israel historically, as we see in Exodus 23 and verse 2, he says, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil, is they had to get into the law of God. And if we do not get into the word of God, to the law of God, the precepts of God's word, the truth, I want to tell you that if we don't do that, it has become so easy to follow, to follow the crowd of the world to do evil. And I'm not talking about just religious issues, moral issues and social issues, because in reality, I guess they're all religious issues. Why the Bible? Look at verses 99 and 100. Back in Psalm 119, he says, I have more understanding than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. I'm not really sure of how many teachers David had as a young man growing up. Not sure that when he was a young man and learning the lessons that all young Jewish boys had to learn. But there were those teachers, those rabbis, those individuals that would have been very important to people of that kind of a society or civilization historically. In verse 100 he says, I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I want my children, I want my grandchildren to know more than me. I want my children and my grandchildren to become even more prosperous in the word of God than me. I want their relationship to be even stronger with God than what my relationship has been. And I want a strong relationship. But do we not all want this for our children and our grandchildren? Because I tell you, there's nothing more important than that. So when he makes a statement, I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts, I thought about that. And the Bible helps me learn from mistakes, even mistakes of the past of others. The mistakes of others. One of the most remarkable things about the Word of God, the Bible to me, is that when we study the Bible and all the characters, that we see a book that tells all, it has incredible transparency to it when you look at the notable characters. If you're talking about Adam and Eve, if you're talking about Noah, if you're talking about Abraham, or you're talking about Isaac, you're talking about Moses, and talking about David, and talking about just any number of of people that are in the Bible, of notable important characters in the Bible, but it just doesn't tell us about the good, righteous things that they did. It doesn't tell us just about their mountaintop experiences. What it tells us about is their lives in total and what we can learn from that. There are some stories in the Bible concerning Adam and Eve, or how about Cain? How about Sodom and Gomorrah, or again, about the failures of David at times, or certainly Solomon, or even Peter, the apostle in the New Testament. And no matter what it is, that even when we look at those difficulties that they faced and where they even failed at times, two things stand out to me. One, is there something that we can learn from their mistakes? Yes. But number two, Can we learn from many, many of them that even though when they've made mistakes, when they've acknowledged it and they turn back to God, did a loving God receive them back? Yes. What's the old adage, the old quote or expression? Those who do not learn from the mistakes of the past are doomed to repeat them. That's true at a lot of levels. This congregation, I think a good many of you can quote Romans 15, 4, if I get you started on it, because you hear me quote, you know, there's those passages that just seems like preachers are quoting all the time. But Romans 15, 4, brethren, help me here. For whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have what? Hope. Now let's look at it again, and I'll say it. But you did a great job there. Now whatever things were written before, the old King James says aforetime, whatever things were written before, before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures 
might have hope. It's not a matter of just learning because of looking at the successes and the achievements of individuals, and we can learn a lot from that too, and be really motivated. I don't want to say, you know, don't look at the good, the positive stuff and where they did it right. No, as a matter of fact, that becomes a pattern to us, doesn't it? But what I'm trying to say is that every bit of this book and what God has preserved, it's been written for our learning. Why the Bible? Because the Bible and its transparency helps me to learn from the mistakes of others in the past. And I hope that we will never take that for granted. That's the import of verse 100. He goes on in verse 101, if you go back to our text. In verse 101, I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. Now understand that David's doing some reflection here, and he's coming to some conclusions about his life, of where he needs to be and what he needs to do. Because I want to ask you, were there times that David's feet did run to misbehavior? Well, we know that about David. But you see, this had been a learning experience for him as well. And brethren, that's why all I can say to you is that yes, there are going to be times that we're going to make mistakes and we're going to stumble and we're going to fall. But what we can learn from David is that God gives us the ability, the opportunity to get up and get back on the path again. And not to lose hope and not to throw in the towel. But to understand that with God's help we can do it. But look at the next verse, 102. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. Now that's David's acknowledgement that God is the one who has taught him. He had already talked about some of his past instructors, even those of old, and that he believed that he had become wiser, even in some of the ancients. But now when we look at this, I I think this and what David is understanding is that the commandments of God, the precepts of God, the law of God, the word of the Lord, the Bible, he understood that the word of God helped him to keep close to God. And why the Bible for us? Because the Bible keeps me close to God. Okay. Those moments in our lives, when we feel tempted, when we feel tempted to go in a direction that we know is not right. And we feel and we see those temptations and those passions that well up. We need to stop. We need to stop right where we are and do what? Open the Bible. And even if we're in a situation that we cannot open the Bible, I'm going to tell you what, that's why commit it, commit it to memory and start quoting scripture, even if it's not, and and, and not necessarily just in your head, maybe even out loud. I don't know, how would that work? I think that might be pretty good that when we're in a situation and things are going where I'm very much tempted to say something that's really not right, not nice to somebody else, and of all of a sudden that I just stop right there and I just say, be kind one to another out loud. They may look at you and say, what was that you said? Be angry and do not sin. In any variety of passages that we might turn to. And all I'll tell you is that what this will do, because this is why the Bible. It's the Bible that keeps us close to God. Where do you feel with your faith right now? How do you feel about your faith? I realize that you're here I realize that you're back tonight, and that that says volumes to me. But really, when you think about it, and you think about your life, you think about your circumstance, and every area of your life, from your job to relationships to finances to all the things that that just go on in life, and and things of which can be obstacles and and a little tricky. What's your relationship with God? How close do you feel to God? And if there are times that we say, you know, I don't feel I'm as close to God as I once was. I think sometimes you just need to ask the question and say, well, then tell me, what have you been doing in the last weeks or months or even years when it comes to the Bible, the Word of God, in your practice of reading it on a regular basis and meditating upon it, as this scripture is really emphasizing? And you will see that there is 
I hope everybody is listening, you will see that there is a direct correlation to our integrity of Scripture to what's going on in our lives very personally, spiritually. Do you see what I'm saying? God's Spirit works through His Word. I I believe that God's Spirit goes to work in our lives. I believe that through the Word that we are convicted by the Holy Spirit. I believe that with all of my heart. Paul said in Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. He would say again in two chapters later, as you know, I've already quoted it and I quote it all the time in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. We look at this situation and what, let me ask you, what do we know about God apart from his word? What do we really know about spirituality or religion? What do we know about Christianity apart from God's word? We know nothing. Or we may acknowledge God's existence as reality because I think one has to be a fool not to see God. Right? The Bible says they're without excuse. So we may acknowledge existence and reality, but not his plan for us. And the only way that we can know about his plan for us so that we can keep close to God is by looking at his word. It is more difficult to sin. It is more difficult to make wrong decisions when we're involved in regular, meditative, prayerful study. When we are involved in regular, meditative, prayerful study, there's a less tendency to sin. Why? Because therein is the strength, the power of God's word. Look at the last two verses that we're considering, 103 and 104. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey, to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Remember when we were reading out this morning of Ecclesiastes 3, and, and while I didn't really preach on the entirety of Ecclesiastes 3, I was using that more as an illustration in the beginning. But in the pairings that remember there's a there's a time, there's a purpose for everything under heaven, right? And it says that there is a time to love and there's a time to what? hate a lot of people say oh no no there's never a time there's no room for hate and and i would disagree with that because the scriptures say otherwise first of all solomon in his wisdom and reflecting his life he says there is a time to hate and what david the very father of solomon had said earlier in this psalm he has god saying i hate every false way god hates every false way and the psalmist hates every false way and we too should hate every false way We don't hate people, but we need to hate the sin and the false way that is embraced by people. But when you look at verse 103, what he is showing before this, it's all a matter of perspective. And the perspective of this is the sweetness of God's word. The Bible is sweet to the taste to those that love God. It really is. Now, sadly, this is not true for everybody. Peter made the point in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 1. He says, therefore, laying aside what all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. Get rid of that stuff. But as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed... You have tasted that the Lord is gracious. How does the Lord taste to you? How does his word taste to you? Now what David said in the psalm because of this right attitude of the law of God and those precepts. He says it is a sweet taste. He says how sweet are your words to my taste sweeter than honey to my mouth. But that is all dependent upon one's reception of the word of God. To some people, the Lord does not taste gracious. 
Both in the books of Jeremiah and in the book of Revelation. We have this analogy that is given. And the prophet of old and John as well, what he sees in the vision on the island of Patmos, are circumstances of where God's word was represented in such a way that it came into the mouth of the prophet, of, of, of the apostle. And that there was a sweetness to it, but when it entered into the stomach, there became a bitterness. And all of that was a representation of what God's word can do. It has this sweetness, but I'll tell you, with some people, as it becomes, as the message becomes very clear, what sounds so very good, oh yes, I love the scripture, oh yes, I want to study the Bible. And then we get in and really study the Bible for what it means and how it challenges us. You know what? It ends up becoming bitter to people. The message of salvation is a bitter message to certain people. You know why it's not a bitter message to you? Because you love the law of God. Because you love the truth. And even when it's challenging. I'll tell you, when we have the right attitude. And I love this. And I can remember years ago. I can remember years ago when Vicky and I were newly married. We hadn't been married very long. Maurice Estes was preaching in Cayucas. And, and there were these powerful sermons. And there were times that he was pouring it on in the application. And it was so challenging. And I felt and I felt very convicted because there were so many times I thought, I am, I am not. I am not doing this right, that, that there's more, that, that there's so much that has been missing that, that I need to do. And But here's what my attitude, I couldn't wait to hear the next sermon. And almost to, became this, pour it on. Do you, does that make sense to any of you? I don't want to be told every service of how great I am. I don't want to be told all the time, oh, that every, it's just, you know, we need to pre preach on the love of God, and we need to preach on, on loving one another, and we do that. But I want to tell you that even when we are challenged to the person that has the right attitude, it's sweet. It's sweet. The sweet word of God. Jeremiah 15, 16, the prophet said, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Do you know what Jeremiah was called? What was Jeremiah called many times? The weeping prophet. Because he saw the miserable condition of Israel. He had to give forth prophecies that were not fun to deliver, sermons he had to preach that he did not want to have to preach. But he says, When I ate your words... Your word was the joy. Your word brought rejoicing to my heart. I ate them. That's what it was to him. The prophet Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 1, Ezekiel 3, 1, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go. Speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. That's because it was received. The reception was positive. The reception was one of faith. A different image that would be given to the Apostle John later to a world that would reject God and to the sweet word of God that would become a sourness or a bitterness to them in their belly. That's the world that we live in. I just say to you, how does God's word taste to you? We must develop a taste for the truth. And all I can tell you as well is we've got to develop this taste for the truth. You know why? Because it's good for us. You know why you should develop a taste for vegetables, for greens? Because it's good for you. And that's what we try to get our children to understand. Eat your vegetables. You know what in the same way? Develop a taste for the word of God. It's our salvation. I have David's earlier psalm as well. A hundred before, when we come, when we come to this, this, to the 19th psalm, I think is a very good summation about his view towards the word of God. We have a, a song that deals with this, Psalm 19. Psalm 19 and verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. And I love singing that song from time to time. I sent Trevor a message. I don't know if he ever got it. That's okay. That's because I depended too much upon electronics. Why the Bible? What a fantastic book. I hope that we will develop such an interest, a great interest, we'll just read it and read it and memorize it and know it and live it and share it with others. We can help you to become closer with God, closer in this relationship. Let us do so. Let that be known. Which come at this time as we stand and sing the song that has been selected.